In this video, we will look at the special case of color vision in primates. This is number seven in our series about color vision. In the last video, we looked at color vision in different animals, which was determined by the number of cones they had. For example, some deep water fish, which live in a very dark environment, have zero cones. They rely solely on rod vision. Marine mammals swimming in shallower depths where there's more light, like whales, dolphins, and seals, have one cone color vision, so they see in grayscale. Terrestrial mammals mostly have two cones. This would include dogs and cats and the rest of the animals listed here. That gives them two color vision, approximately like this. Taking a broader look at mammals, here is a diagram showing that almost all have two cones, except for the primates, which are a special case. Humans and a few primates are privileged to have three cones, giving us a trichromatic or three color palette. However, color vision among primate groups is surprisingly variable, even within the same species. This is a very interesting problem in biology, and it is the subject of this video. Before we start, let us briefly review the basics of color vision. Light from the outside world is focused by the cornea and lens. Within the eye, the retina is the part that senses light, the specialized cells called rods and cones, so named for their particular shapes. As the photoreceptors receive the light, that triggers a nerve impulse that is sent along the optic nerve back to the brain. In the previous videos, we covered the details of how rods and cones function. In both types of photoreceptors, the light sensing structure has two parts. Retinal is the molecule that absorbs the photon of light. It is derived from vitamin A. The retinal molecule is embedded in an opsin protein, and it is differences in the opsin molecule that determines the color of light each photoreceptor is sensitive to. Just so we are clear, incoming light is absorbed by the retinal, which causes the opsin to trigger a cascade of events that results in the sending of a nerve impulse announcing the arrival of a photon of light. Rods and cones are different in a number of ways in addition to shape, the most important of which is that cones function in bright light and give us our color vision. In dim light, rods give us grayscale vision like this. They do not contribute to color vision in daylight. Here is the complement of photoreceptors that we have, with each of the cones shown by the colors they are named for. A more accurate way to look at the cones is by the part of the spectrum that each is most sensitive to. The naming convention works like this. Blue light has a short wavelength, so these are called either blue cones or S cones. Here is the peak of rod sensitivity, but again, they don't contribute to color vision. The green sensing cone operates in the middle wavelengths, so it is called an M cone. Toward the red end, this cone senses longer wavelength light, so it is called an L cone. Here is the range of opsin pigments that are thought to have been present at the beginning of the vertebrate line. Four opsins for color and one for rods. The additional opsin senses in the ultraviolet range. In case you were wondering, cones developed long before rods. As vertebrate lines diverged, each branch ended up with somewhat different complements of cones. In this illustration, we have narrowed our focus to the range of color vision among mammals. For simplicity, only the color opsins are shown. In general, most mammals have two cone types, making them dichromatic. At the bottom are primates, which have three types of pigments, giving them three color or trichromatic vision. What is the advantage of three colors over two? As an example, here is a Rousseau painting that shows the world roughly as a dichromat would see it. One thing to understand about primates is that a large part of their diet consists of fruit. Ripe fruit is better, but in this view, how can you tell ripe versus unripe? Everything looks the same. Here in the three color view, the advantage of the third pigment is strikingly apparent, being able to see the red and orange color of ripe fruit. This review by B.C. Reagan on fruit, foliage, and color vision documents in great detail the work done investigating the advantage of seeing the extra color in the primate's home environment. In the end, they also discuss the ability to find ripe fruit 
works to the mutual advantage of both the animals for food and the plants for seed dispersal. Primates fall into two broad groups named for their geographic origin. Those in Africa and Asia are called Old World. Examples are listed here, including apes and humans. Those in Central and South America are called New World. Examples are listed, including squirrel monkeys, marmosets, etc. In categorizing color vision among primates, here is the situation that we are faced with. As we said before, most mammals have two color vision. Primates in the Old World, both male and female, mostly have three color vision. But primates in the New World have a different arrangement. Among females, two-thirds have three color vision. One-third of females and all males have two color vision. But they have three long wavelength pigments to choose from. That makes their vision, quote, polychromatic, end quote, which we will talk about more in a moment. So how to explain all of that? A very long time ago, the continents were all joined in one large land mass. Animals had freedom to spread out. As time passed and land masses moved apart, animal populations became divided, living on different continents. Thus, the separation into old and new world groupings. At about 65 million years ago, the time when the continents were separating, our ancestral mammals were small furry creatures that were probably nocturnal to avoid the larger daytime predators. Because they were active in the dark, it's thought that there was less use for color vision, so only two cone pigments were maintained, one short wavelength and one long wavelength, making them dichromatic. The RH2 and S1 were lost. Later, after a great extinction event rid the world of the large predators, that was the dinosaurs, mammals gained the freedom to roam in daylight. To understand what happens next, we have to talk a bit about genetics. Here are all 23 pairs of human chromosomes, 22 pairs of autosomes, and the one pair of sex chromosomes, the X and Y. This shows all the chromosomes, but nicer in color. Concentrating on pair number 23, the X and Y, if someone has one X and one Y, they are male. With two Xs, they are female. Stop and think for a minute what it means to have two copies of the X chromosome. If both copies are actively producing gene products, the cell would have twice as much of the X chromosome proteins as the same cell in a male who has only one X chromosome. That actually is not a good arrangement for those cells. In females, nature has taken care of this problem by inactivating one of the two X chromosomes. That neatly results in one X chromosome worth of gene product. Which X is inactivated is random. A consequence of random inactivation is that if each X chromosome happens to have a different form of a particular gene, it affects which one is expressed within a given cell line. We will come back to this after we have taken closer look at the genes involved. Back to the whole karyotype. The gene for the S or blue pigment is on chromosome 7. The gene for the long wavelength or red pigment is on the X chromosome. The X chromosome is also the location of the gene for the middle wavelength green pigment. In fact, the L and M genes are actually right next to one another. This is where all the action is. Now, let's take a look at the color genes in our primates. The simplest case is a male from the old world with one X chromosome. He gets blue on chromosome 7 and green and red on the X chromosome. In New World primates, there is still blue on number 7, but the X chromosome only carries one color gene. But it is possible for one gene to have different forms. They are called alleles. In this case, the different forms of the gene can code for either a red, a green, or an intermediate pigment. The male primate in the New World, with only one X chromosome, can have blue plus either a red, a green, or a yellow pigment, making him a dichromat, but with a range of pigment possibilities. 
This is what we called polychromatic before. Can you guess how the arrangement will turn out for a female who has two X chromosomes? For a female in the old world, the result is still simple. She has both the red and green genes on each X chromosome. Even when one X is inactivated, she still has copies of both pigments. She is trichromatic. Now, with the female New World primate, things get more interesting. She has two X's, and each X could have three possible colors. Here is a table with all nine of the possible combinations. Three have the same color on both X's. This is termed homozygous. The chromosomes look like this. Here I am showing red on both, but it could be green or yellow on both. It doesn't matter which chromosome is inactivated, this female will have only two cone pigments. This is the one-third of females that are dichromats. The other two-thirds of the females, six of the nine squares, have one of the three other possible pairings. For example, here is one case, red and green. Because X inactivation is random, some cones express red and other cones express green. But it could be any of these combinations. The end result is several slightly different versions of three-color vision. To recap, we have seen that old world primates, male and female, have three-color vision because they have both red and green genes on the X chromosome. New world primates have a mixed or polychromatic system. With only one color gene on the X chromosome, certain females have three color vision, while the remaining females and all males have two color vision. But there is more to this story. We return to the retina for a minute. The cones in the central retina form a mosaic, shown here magnified. If you stop and think about it for a minute, each cone cell has the genetic ability to express multiple ops and pigments. Close examination of the retina shows that the very center of the fovea contains just red and green cones. Blue cones are a small minority and they are not found in the center of the fovea. To get this random cone distribution, X inactivation would be a useful explanation if there was only one opsin gene per X chromosome. But when there are two genes on the X chromosome, there must be something more involved. It turns out that there are control regions on each chromosome that determine which genes are expressed in a given cell. On the X chromosome, there is a control region that determines whether the red or green is expressed. Now, looking at the even bigger picture, the next question to ask is how this difference between old and new world primates came to be. A complex and interesting puzzle for biologists to solve. We will look at two possible scenarios that we will call story A and story B. Here is story A, which seems pretty straightforward. We will theorize that the common ancestor of both lines had blue and red pigment on chromosomes 7 and X, respectively. From here on out, I am leaving out chromosome 7, which held the blue gene, for clarity because that doesn't change. For primates in the old world, an event could have happened in which the long wavelength gene on the X chromosome was duplicated. Perhaps that sounds odd, but it actually is not that rare an occurrence. This was followed sometime later by a minor mutation in the duplicate gene that shifted the sensitivity slightly, yielding the new middle wavelength green pigment. The close relation of the M and L pigments is supported by their very similar DNA sequences. The end result has both genes, M and L, residing on the X chromosome. In the new world, here again is the possible common ancestor with a single long wavelength pigment. Simple mutations in the L gene could have created three separate versions, each slightly different in sensitivity. The end result, new world primates with three different versions of the L pigment. This story A has the advantage of simplicity but it has a problem. The DNA sequences of the middle wavelength genes are so close, it seems unlikely that they arose along separate pathways, what is called convergent evolution. As an alternative, professors Jacobs and Nathans 
and other researchers offer story B. In this version, the ancestors of the New World and Old World primates probably had the three alleles like the current New World primates. After the populations were separated, a genetic event occurred in the Old World line. Frequently, when cells divide, chromosome pairs exchange corresponding sections. This is called recombination or crossing over. Sometimes an error occurs where the exchange is unequal. In this case, the error could have resulted in the presence of two pigment genes, M and L, on one X chromosome. Therefore, both males and females who got this X chromosome had three-color vision. The selective advantage was significant enough to establish this X chromosome in the population with the eventual disappearance of the other X chromosome. Meanwhile, primates in the New World retained the three allele arrangement. And thus we have the current leading theory as to how the difference in color vision between primates in the Old and New Worlds arrived. What a great puzzle! If you think gene duplication is unlikely, the modern ability to do gene sequencing has turned up the following unexpected result. On the human X chromosome, there is often more than one copy of each pigment. The expected complement of one green and one red occurs in 25% of humans. 50% have three pigment genes, and the remaining 25% have four or more. How about that? This is the basis of some of the complexity and variability in human color vision and color deficient vision which we will cover in a future video. Here are selected references, including the leading researchers, if you want to read mo more details about this fascinating story.